At this point, I would like to, I would like to introduce to you our speaker for the week. She has for us a very, very interesting theme, a revival and a reformation. And I want to believe that we've all been through a difficult times, a very challenging experiences to the extent that sometimes we felt like we we're a bit distant from the Lord and we felt like we needed a revival. I certainly need revival and restoration because as you can imagine in our journey of life, there are times when you actually meet with the devil and there's a lot of punching that happens in that space. And I am glad that this week, our sister joins us all the way from the United States. Her name is Pastor Donette Blake. I'll be sharing with you her bio, which is quite lengthy in bits and pieces throughout the week. So this morning, I just wanna let you know that um, her ministry in the Northeastern Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church began in 2002, when she began serving as chaplain of the education department. In 2007, she became the first female to be employed as pastor in the Northeastern Conference and was installed as the assistant pastor of the Kingsboro Temple of Seventh-day Adventists. Dr. Blake, the time is yours. Your brothers and sisters are waiting to hear you speaking to us as the Lord inspires. Thank oh. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. I'm saying good night, and it's your good morning. So you have slept. I have not yet slept, but it is a joy that we can all connect. Whether slept or not, we can connect and praise the Lord together. This is what it's all about. Amen, somebody. And so Amen. I can't wait until we all get to heaven where there will be no time difference, but that we will be one happy family together with the Lord. But until then, we praise God for technology. I'm so honored to be here with you. So I say a blessed morning to all of you, wherever you're viewing from. Somebody, it may be your afternoon. For some, it may be the evening. I don't know. But just in case you're with us, I just want you to know I'm excited to be here with you. And so I thank our host for kind words of introduction. And when you were introduced, when you were reading the introduction, I was thinking to myself, wow, the internet is an amazing thing because I have no clue where you got that from. <laughs> But I praise God that uh, we have the technology that we can be able to use for God's glory. So I want to share with us this morning, I want to share with us this morning uh, a word from the book of Isaiah 53. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Lord and Savior of mankind, we thank you for the privilege of gathering on this moment and this time to just be drawn closer to you, to commune with you. So bless this moment. Now I pray and let your name be glorified and be exalted. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. All right, let me get right into this this morning. Um, no passage in the Bible is so saturated with a substitution, um, uh, uh, the language of substitution as Isaiah chapter 53. This particular passage, Isaiah 53, proclaimed to the entire world and for all time, the way by which God, a very holy God, um, can justify unholy and rebellious sinners and still remain just. The words of uh, verses uh, four through six is what get my attention. Those words truly capture my attention. They are powerful and, and the words uh, um, declare, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. My, my, my attention though captured by these verses is settled and zeroed in on verse five specifically. So I wanna spend the next few minutes just kind of zero in on the text and especially verse five. You see, the text reminds me that, that there is a God who gave everything and made every way possible to restore mankind. A God who was willing to take the place of man in all Order to restore man to his rightful place. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah this morning. The Bible is clear. When we get into the old, the New Testament rather, we recognize that when Jesus came to earth, Jesus became acquainted with the misery and the suffering of the human race. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought unto him all sick people, all the people that were sick. They were taken with diverse diseases. They were torment. Those who were oppressed, possessed with devils, and those who were lunatic, they were crazy, and those who had the palsy. And the Bible said, and Jesus healed them. Whatever the disease, Whatever the sickness, whatever the pain, whatever the suffering, the Bible says, hallelujah, they took everyone to Jesus that they could, and Jesus healed them. So what we notice from the New Testament is that day after day, when Jesus walked on earth, he stood in the trenches of human suffering and he healed all those who came to him. There was none who needed healing that came to Jesus and left without experiencing the healing they needed, except they did not want to be healed. There was never a person who came seeking for help, came seeking for healing and left without that healing. He never turned anyone away. Jesus healed every disease he encountered. He dried every tear that was shed in his presence. He soothed every aching and broken spirit who sought him out. But understand, all of what Jesus did in the New Testament in terms of the healing and touching lives and relieving folks, all of those were just simply a picture of the deeper spiritual healing that Jesus came to do. So Jesus came to do something more than just physical healing. Oftentimes, oftentimes, when we read Isaiah 53 and we read the words by his stripes or with his stripes we are healed, we claim that as a promise for physical healing and it rightly so. However, when we look at the text, we'll recognize that this is more than just temporary physical healing. You see, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us in John chapter 10, 10, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came in order for us to have life. And this is not about physical life because we were living physically when Jesus came. We were living in sin. We had a physical life. But Jesus said, I came that they might have life. What kind of life is Jesus talking about? The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, 16, that God gave his only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, hallelujah, but would have eternal life. Jesus came not merely in regards to the physical life that we have on earth, but in order to bring healing to the spiritual life that we might have eternal life. So he's come into earth when he said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. It was not just a mere living on earth, having a good life. No, no, no. It was about that abundant life in Jesus Christ. It was about the eternal life. It was about the life to be lived in the world to come. 
come. I have come that they might have life. Come on, folks. We can't afford to be called Christians and live in life that simply are on the low planes of life. Life that, that, that is just scratching the surface of life. Life that is troubled and, and difficult. No, no, no. Jesus came that we might have life, that we might be conquerors, hallelujah, in this life, that amidst the suffering, that amidst the pain, that amidst all that we go through, that we could still look at trouble in the face and said, not today, because I serve a mighty God who has given me life abundantly. I've come that they might have life. And that they, they might have it more abundantly. And so Jesus' central mission was not to perform temporary healings, hallelujah, for the people who would later die anyway. The mission or the central mission of Jesus was to die as the substitute for the sins of his people. This is what Isaiah is talking about. He came to be a substitute, to die as a substitute for the sins of his people, that his people may have eternal life, that his people may have abundant life, a life that disease and death would never have the power over. So in this life, we may suffer. We watch our loved ones die. We ourselves may be stricken with all manner of disease and we have no healing for it and we are struggling through it. But understand that, that, that Jesus have power not only to bring healing, but the more important aspect is not just healing of the physical body, but the spiritual soul. I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This is the mission, the central mission of Jesus. And too often, too often, too often, I know my time is limited, but too often, can I just say that? So many of us kind of get stuck in the temporal. We tend to come to Jesus seeking for temporal blessings, asking Jesus to do this in this life and to do that in this life, all about our survival in this life. But the mission of Jesus, Jesus came not so much about life here on earth because life on earth is a miserable life. Jesus came to lift us up above the measure of this life. He came that we might have eternal life. That's the mission. That's the purpose of Jesus coming. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And so the Bible said, the Bible said, Isaiah chapter 43, verse five, the verse I want to zero in on, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Now watch something about the text. Do you notice the language of substitution in the text? He was. Mm -hmm. wounded for our transgression. He bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was where? On him. Mm -hmm. With his stripes, we are healed. You see it. You notice the language of substitution. It is him and us. You know what I'm saying? He came to take our place. It's just about him and us, right? We were dead in sin, steeped in rebellion and iniquities. We were at war and enmity, the Bible said, with God. We deserve the death penalty. But Jesus, hallelujah, somebody shout amen. Come on, somebody just unmute and shout hallelujah right now. Jesus. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Oh we were destined for death. We deserved the death penalty, but Christ stood in our place, all our rebellion and all our iniquities, God transferred it to Jesus at the cross. Christ, therefore, as it were, was now at war with God. Can you imagine that? God at war with himself because of the sins of humanity being placed and God at the cross. 
Christ in him, his humanity took our sin. God, the Bible said, placed all our sin on Jesus. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Jesus who deserved no death took my place and was subject to the death penalty. As a matter of fact, he received the sentence of death. He received the death penalty and was wounded. The Bible said for our transgression. He took the punishment that was meant for us and died the death that we should have died. Like a hiker who sees a friend bitten by a rattlesnake and, and, and immediately that friend sucks the poison out of his his friend's foot wherever the snake bit him. He sucks that poison out with his own mouth. So Jesus, mm, when we were bitten by that deadly snake, that old serpent called the devil, we were inflicted by this devil with the poison of sin. Jesus, in his mercy came down and sucked the poison out with his own life. Jesus saw us bitten by this deadly poison acre, ready to die by the poison of sin. And instead of standing by and watching us die, Jesus, the Bible said, left the splendor of heaven, came down to this earth and died the death that we deserve to die. So the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 53, verse five, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement, the punishment, Jesus, of our peace was upon him. The punishment that was meant to bring our peace and to bring about our peace was upon Jesus. And with his stripes, we are healed. I would love to stay a little bit longer on this uh, line with the stripes where he, but I think I'll pick it up one evening this week. So the wounding and the bruising and the chastising of Christ heals us perfectly from etern and eternally rather from the poison of sin. The wounding, he was wounded. The bruising, he was bruised. The chastisement, the chastisement of our peace that was upon him. All of this bring healing to the people of God. And we're not talking about the physical at this moment, but the spiritual healing from sin, healing from fear, healing from all the maladies of this wicked world from the devil's trap. Are you listening to me tonight? There is not one of us who need to continue living in sin because by the power of Jesus Christ, we have been rescued from the power of sin. He was wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that gave us peace, rested on him. And all of his suffering brought about the healing of the soul from sin. And so as I come to an end of this particular message this evening, I'll pick it up again, but listen to me. Would to God that we would understand the deep humiliation, the suffering, the trial, that Christ endured to save sinners like us from the wrath of God. If we could only understand it and take a hold of Jesus, if we could only understand that God in his mercy through Jesus Christ has secured the victory of our salvation, then none of us need to be lost that none of us need to be struggling under the burden of guilt and shame and sin, but that the blood of Jesus rescued us from all unrighteousness. If we could only understand that Christ secured our salvation with his own life, no man but Jesus, then we would understand that no one can condemn us <laughs> Hallelujah. If we could only put our hand in the hand of God, 
regardless of where we have been, regardless of what we have done, if we could only rest our hand in the hand of God, he will lead us out of our mess. He will lead us out of the pit that we find ourselves in, out of the carelessness that we are living in, out of the, the very fact that we are so content in sin. If we could only trust God, then we would experience the abundant life that he came to give us. For he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace rested on him and with his stripes, hallelujah, we are healed. So in closing tonight, I say, I read something some time, some time ago in Signs of the Times, page 2,447, page 2,447. And it says, it is a marvel to the angels that human beings should choose to be incapable of realizing how greatly Christ humiliated himself in their behalf. Angels marvel that men and women do not rejoice to acknowledge Christ as their savior, to accept him as their leader and to follow his example of self-denial. Hmm? Angels marvel that the course followed by human beings seems so strangely inconsistent with what we profess. Angels wonder why being human beings dependent on their creator for every breath they take act so unreasonable. They marvel and they wonder why us as human beings choose the side of the one who crucified Christ. Hmm? Angels marvel why we who are dependent on God for every breath we breathe, every breath we take, should choose to give the devil our service instead of serving the Prince of Peace. May God help us to recognize this afternoon, this morning rather, this morning, that with his stripes, we are healed. And by his grace, we have power to overcome. May God grant us peace as we look to him for deliverance from the things that keep us captive in the power of sin. Father, in the name of Jesus, give us victory. Turn us away from the things that hold us captive in sin. Deliver us, set us free, and help us to walk in a life abundant with you. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen.